Hey guys, welcome to our first episode of DeFi Roundup number one. Um, so we're going to be doing these uh, these shows, I would say, three times a week. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, we haven't fully found out the time yet, but we wanted to kind of just jumpstart some of it. Because um, there's a lot of news that's happening within DeFi, especially after DeFi Summit, uh, you know, the, the whole entire conference. So we wanted to kind of update you guys on some of the things and, um, you know, kind of be able to just you know, really show you, you know, what's going on in DeFi, anything that you, you know, any questions that you guys have, you know, we'll most likely be able to answer them. Um, and just kind of like digging into some of these other things, uh, especially with like the growth of DeFi as well. Uh, I, I guess to kind of like kick start it off a little bit is to kind of talk a little bit about the markets. Um, so if you can kind of look on the screen, we're right now we're, we're at that phase where we're bouncing a little bit. Uh, we saw ETH the other day around, you know, 1,700. Bitcoin was hovering around that 33 mark. And from there, you know, we, we, we had to have that Wyckoff pattern play off a little bit. And even till today as well, it's like a lot of the coins are, uh, I would say, extending a little bit. Like Kusama dropped down to like 170. You know, it, <laughs> Kusama really dropped down a little bit um, more than I anticipated. But if you look at like kind of like the all-time high all the way down as well, is that we saw like the high... I think it was like 600. Yeah, 623, and now it's all the way down to around 217. But it's one of the top ones right now that's doing a bounce uh, within within the the different types of tokens. And then also, if you look at like the different charts as well, is that we can kind of see Kusama's bounce if it loads. All right. So you can also see some of uh, different indicators that we can place on really quickly. Uh, I got the lines. Yep. Sorry, it's, uh, these indicators are looking a little, little iffy right now. But, <laughs> but yeah, we can also see how like the the fifteen to thirty minute as well was that it went all the way down to around one fifty six, and then it kind of bounced off. We have a little line of resistance down here at one sixty one. Uh, right after that, it just literally skyrocketed, broke through the first support. Now it's on the way to the second one, third one. And, uh, you know, like with the overall interior support as well, it's like we're still seeing resistance in the market, even though it's looking bullish today. So my advice would be to kind of look at the charts a little bit further. Uh, it is showing a sell, a sell signal, unfortunately, for Kusama, for Ethereum. So we just past the, let's see, DMI, and D, uh, so the uh, direction moving index, a uh, direction moving indicator, and also the um, the demand index as well, showing a buy signal for ETH. But you also have to look at the pie cycle, which is around, which would kind of like gauge between some of the bottoms and tops, uh, around 2220. So we still have that kind of momentum for that too, with a big, I would say big support around that 1809 phase. So I guess we'll see how it kind of plays out. Um, but we kind of wanted to jump into, you know, I, I wanted to kind of jump into some of the different news that's happening today. Um, if you kind of look at the first website is watchtheburn.com. So EIP 1559 for Ethereum, which means that it burns every sing, uh, burns a, little, a small portion of ETH around every single transaction. You can start seeing that on the test net that's already deployed on that it's already start currently burning. So with Ethereum, Ethereum does have a infinite supply. So you can kind of create as much as you want, and you can kind of vote on the different proposals for it to have, you know, increase inflation, decrease inflation. Um, but right now, we're still seeing that EIP one five five nine being implemented. So you know, as it rolls out of testnet and goes into mainnet, you can kind of track the fees in live time um, on the testnet phase. So you can kind of look at the different, I would say, different areas for it. Uh, to see if it's going to provide, you know, whether it's going to be super deflationary or whether proof of stake is actually going to kick in. And we're going to start seeing a little bit of a higher demand uh, for the transaction volumes. Another diff another um, little piece of news as well is that Compound Labs is launching their treasury to provide institutional support for a lot of the, I would say, in, uh, institutional investors. Now, I, I kind of tweeted about this a while back saying CFI is definitely going to go into DeFi because of the fact that if you have such a big industry that's already now, you know, competing with some of the banks for, you know, rev share, you're going to have to have an area to where you provide a, a service uh, that's going to be use, useful to the banks in order to get into DeFi. And especially with 
with them, they don't have, want to have, you know, different exposures to crypto. They don't want to hit in permanent loss within some of the liquidity pools. They don't want to get the risk of, you know, potentially getting rugged, things like that. So in order to kind of do that, uh, Compound is launching kind of like an institutional grade um, area. So institutions, uh, institutional DeFi to kind of be able to allow institutions to onboard and then from there be able to have a stable yield. Uh, because for them, they really want to have this yield to where they can actually plan their PL and plan their profits and loss around the space. So if they're looking at, let's say, potential 4% per year, that's going to beat them on you know certain investments and stuff like that. But having a guaranteed interest rate for USDC of uh, 4%, this is going to bring in a lot of liquidity, especially for the USDC pair onto Compound. And it also opens up the doors for the first institutional investors to really jump on and you know utilize this yield within DeFi without having I would say like that big risk of you know going into DeFi getting rug pulled and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know having to jump through hurdles because for them they don't want to have it to where it's you know they're they don't want to go too deep into crypto but at the same time they they want to still you know pr provide a, a way to get yield off of their uh, off of their investments. Uh, another piece of news as well is that uh, <laughs> so. Craig Wright, you know, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto um, is what he claimed he is. is uh, so he actually won a lawsuit over the paper, uh, white paper copyright claim for Bitcoin.org. So if you guys haven't been on Bitcoin.org, it's basically an organization, a uh, website dedicated around Bitcoin, showing the white paper, showing different um, how to understand Bitcoin more. It's like a, a educational uh, site. And also for that too, um, so with, within the within the uh, the lawsuit, Craig Wright claims to have created Bitcoin, and he actually won by default. So the recourse of this is that Bitcoin.org how now has to remove the Bitcoin white paper from the website for only uh, for UK uh, visitors. And also in one of the comments as well is that Cobra, which is a you know pseudonymous operator of Bitcoin.org, um, has to display a notice on his website about the judgment, pay at least 35,000 uh, 35, pounds or $48,600 in legal fees and remove the white paper from the website. So Cobra lost his case through a default judgment, which he mounted no defense to preserve his pseudonymity. So with this really lies a big concern because if you're able to go onto websites and, you know, of course, sue and be able to remove the white paper just to kind of you know, propagate if you want to place on your own white paper and stuff like that. But the thing about this is that if they went into a decentralized network, it would be almost impossible in order to like, especially like decentralized hosting, like how Akash has it, it would be almost impossible to kind of pinpoint or take down something. Right. And I, you know, with how this plays out as well, it's like what happens if other websites start posting up white papers and things like that, and it has to be removed because it's not the quote, quote, right copy, or if they want it to be taken down. So, I think later on, we're going to start seeing a lot more people switch over to Akash um, for decentralized hosting of their of their web provider. And then from there, you know, eliminate a lot of the different middlemans and especially being able to skirt some of the, let's say, regulations and stuff like that. But um, we'll see how, how they are going to implement this because Cobra, if they're going to be able, to, if they're going to want to remove the white paper or if not, you know, since he is anonymous, it's technically doesn't have any legal right to say, hey, look, I can just do whatever I want, but we'll kind of see how it plays out. Another piece of news as well that's pretty interesting is also the index coup uh, is going to be including um, Badger DAO in DPI. Uh, DPI uh, so it's DeFi, uh, DeFi Pulse Index uh, for August. So with DeFi, uh, with DeFi Pulse, it's basically an index to where <laughs> Ikebel said, is that Akash only for hosting? Well, Akash has a lot of different services that you can kind of utilize in order to have that um, that infrastructure. But you can it's not only just for, for hosting. It could also be for execution as well. So let's say if you wanted to have AWS services on the, instead of having it on the Amazon, uh, you know, Amazon Cloud, you can have it on Akash to run some of these functions as well. Uh, for DPI, basically, it's an index that allows you to add, let's say, a different, uh, I believe it's a few different types of currencies on there. Yeah. So it's going to be, uh, right now, it's Uni has its largest allocation in the DPI index, which roughly 26.5%, uh, followed by Aave at 18.4, Maker at 13.5, and Compound at 9.3, with a little bit of allocations between Sushi, YFI, and Synthetics. Now, so what happens within the index is that it basically rebalances itself. 
so that let's say for example if dpi is having it to where uni is providing less value or sushi is providing more value you can actually that you can actually vote to balance that out so think of it as like an index that rebalances itself uh through through votes so they're thinking of including badger dao one um, but they're just waiting on support from wrap bitcoin because if you look at badger dao badger dao's biggest liquidity pair is wrap bitcoin and badger dao is literally made um to have bitcoin on multiple chains not just one so uh once wrap bitcoin gets enabled you'll start seeing uh, badger dao within the next uh let's say within the next month in order for them to add it onto their in, into their index Moving on to the next piece of news as well is that DeFi exploit streaks hits Polygon. Uh, safe dollar crashes to zero. Now, I don't know who did this reporting and make it look like Polygon did something wrong, but yeah, it's so the basically for this uh, safe dollar has been exploited and it collapsed to zero. So safe dollar was a stable coin, uh, algorithmic stable coin that was on layer two, which is on Polygon. And then from there, the uh, the attackers stole $248,000 in USDC and Tether uh, from the protocol. Now, you also have to remember that whenever you're getting into stable coins or even any DeFi protocols, that they're all, they're, they are going to be prone to exploits. And for me personally, stable coins have the highest risk of going to zero, um, especially with the competition with it. Because if you're having a, let's say, algorithmic stable coin, whether it's the retraction, contraction, things like that, whether it's even you know backed by, backed by tokens and things, the, the hardest business is stablecoin business within crypto. That's why USDC and Tether have been you know, vetted around. But even for that too, it's like USDC does have a centralized component, same as Tether. Um, the other stablecoin I would say like would be the preferred choice would be like DAI. DAI has a under collateralized uh, model from Maker. So you know those three types have been you know tested uh, for a while. I mean, even USDC and, and, and Tether as well as that, they can also freeze transactions. So. If, if you're looking at the, the stablecoin business is that you have to be really careful whenever you're looking into them because it can actually, it can either be a very, very profitable business for the company itself, or it can be a really strenuous business for people that are investing into stablecoins, right? If you're looking at arbitrage at 90 cents or up to a dollar and 10, you know, there could potentially be, you know, a, an arbitrage opportunity between, between, you know, 10 to 20% at times, but stablecoins shouldn't fluctuate more than you know, up to like 5% is like really, really high fluctuation, you know, 2% is even high fluctuation. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, there's been an exploit on, <clears throat> on safe dollar, but it has nothing to link to with, uh, with Polygon. I mean, if you remember that Polygon is an EMV compatible blockchain that's built to anchor back onto, uh, back onto Ethereum. So if you have an e uh, EV, EVM, sorry, <laughs> Ether no, Ethereum virtual machine, yeah. So if you have you know, ERC-20s and things like that, you can actually deploy the same type of smart contracts onto layer two. Same thing as like Binance Smart Chain, right? You can deploy it onto there as well. So if you've already seen some of these exploits on you know, regular Ethereum, you're now looking at it on another layer. Um, same thing's gonna happen to almost any blockchain, right? There's always gonna be room for attacks. There's always gonna be room for exploits, but just kind of like keeping yourself safe is to make sure that you know you're you're practicing due diligence on a lot of these things. Another another interesting piece of news as well is for uh, for Bitcoin.com, uh, so BTC.com. So actually, if you're looking at the different hashing, um, I would say difficulties uh, for for Bitcoin, it looks like within the next four, I would say five days or so, we're looking at a difficulty adjustment of twenty four percent. So what happens to a uh, what happens to Bitcoin when the difficulty adjustment happens? Is that it gets uh, it gets less difficult to mine the block. So what happens is that miners don't need as much hashing power, but at the same time, if the hashing power is still up there, what happens is that all of these blocks are now competing against each other, but it's going to lead to easier solves, right? Because whenever you're solving a block for Bitcoin, you have to find the nonce that's going to be placed within the transaction and then confirmed by the whole network. So if you get the first confirmation you know you are technically the you know the winner of the block in order to get the rewards but with the difficulty adjustment what happens is that the the difficulty goes down so it's easier for smaller miners to kind of have another you know advantage in order to you know join the pool um so also for that too it's <clears throat> whenever it gets easier a lot of miners tend to you know either a be able to to over create a lot of the blocks so the blocks push a little bit further 
Um, but at the same time, it's like if there's a lot more, if, if it's easier to mine, a lot more people are going to be coming in to kind of compete against it in order to mine it. But if, say, it drops, you know, 24%, what happens is that miners might be able to mine a lot more efficiently by, you know, you know utilizing less hashing rate. Uh, so what they'll do is that the blocks actually come a little bit quicker because they're able to be solved a little bit quicker. But at the same time, it also gives them an opportunity to potentially say, hey, look, if it's not costing me that much electricity, I might want to sell a little bit off of it because it's cheaper to mine right now. Um, let's see. Another piece of news as well is that Balancer just released out that they're going to be that, that they're on Polygon. And uh, for those that don't know what uh, Balancer is, Balancer is I would say, think of it as like a fund manager that's going to be decentralized, right? You can have it to where you can have a different portfolio each time. So let's say, for example, if I wanted to have, you know, ETH and wrap Bitcoin, right? You can do a liquidity pair on any of the DEXs. So if I want to go on Uniswap, SushiSwap, QuickSwap, like any of these decentralized exchanges that provide LP solutions, so I can deposit just 50 and 50. But there's no way to kind of do it a four-way, uh, I would say a four-way pegging, right? So let's say I have four assets that I'm really, really long in. Like I want to have Link, Wrapped Ether, uh, Balancer, and Aave, for example, like this pool right here. But I want to do it at a 25% split each so that I can utilize four tokens at once. So that's what Balancer does. Balancer creates a, a investment pool. So from there, you can kind of adjust and fine tune uh, different percentages as well. So if you wanted to create you know, 25% Link, 10% Ethereum, you know, 20% Balancer, 50%, you know, whichever, uh, you can actually create those pools and from there be able to kind of, I would say, either minimize your risk or even increase your risk as well, depending on, you know, what your risk appetite is. So, for example, if you have a 50-50 pool between, you know, uh, USDC and USDT, of course, it's going to be very, I would say, stable. But let's say if you wanted to add a little bit of a risk factor in there and you're saying, hey, look, I want to speculate on Ethereum. So I'm going to put it at... 25% wrapped ETH, 25% uh, wrapped ETH, and then the other 75% you distribute into USDC and USDT. So it, it gives you like that 25% impermanent loss factor. So it can actually lower your impermanent loss at certain times. Um, but also for that too, it's like depending on the the different pools as well. Is that some of them are incentivized. So if you look at the APYs on some of these, um, you know you can kind of see the differences between how would say incentivized pools and non-incentivized pools. So for, let's say, for example, like the incentivized pools, they provide a yield of balancer back to the user. So think of it as like farming for Uniswap, right? Or SushiSwap, you're farming, but with multiple pairs. Uh, it couldn't be, it, you can have it as like one or two different pairs, or you can have it up to six different pairs or eight different pairs, depending on your risk appetite. Uh, and then from there, you know, place it into pools. But if you're looking at some of the yields right now, it's, I mean, like if you're looking at like 200% APY, yes, of course it is a little bit of a, of an appeal, but also have to remember that, you know, these things are still new. Uh, Balancer just released onto to Polygon um, to get these APYs. But also for that too, it's like if Balancer has the same code, exact same code from Balancer that's on Ethereum, you don't have to, you know, anything that happens on Ethereum can also happen on, on Polygon as well. Um, and you can kind of compare the different rates between Balancer and I would say the Ethereum Balancer as well. So the first one's on Polygon, the second one's on Ethereum. So let me find a pair real quick. So let's say, for example, Balancer USDC wrapped ETH. Balancer USDC wrapped ETH. Right, never mind. <laughs> but yeah, just just to kind of like look over the different APYs as well is that you know the the layer one one, the one that's on Ethereum isn't as incentivized as the first one, but it also has a lot more liquidity as well to kind of be able to pull and also a lot of volume. So the average volume right now on Balancer on Poly on Polygon is less than a min uh, less than a million between the last twenty four hours, while this one already has I would say twenty five plus million already. Uh, Iqbal has a question. What are your thoughts on Osmosis? So Osmosis is pretty interesting because that here. Let's let's actually go over to Osmosis. So for Osmosis, the yields are a lot higher as well. 
But you also have to remember that it's built uh, it's built for Cosmos. So IBC just opened up so that they're allowing inner blockchain communications between different blockchains so that now you can link together Atom, Osmosis, uh, Akash, um, you know, Iris, Crypto.com, uh, Persistence as well, so that you're able to link a lot of these tokens that were very segregated in their own blockchains, but now are providing you know, that asset uh, onto the different pools. Now, Osmosis is also still fairly new as well. So some of the, I would say like some of the liquidity is, you know, it, it's still a little bit early as well. Um, you know, Atom Osmosis has the highest liquidity pairing, uh, AKT and Atom as well. Um, but you're kind of seeing some of these other pools also pop off as well. Now for the APYs as well, the more people that are going into these pools, what happens is that the APY fluctuates down in order to compensate um, because you need to distribute it on a wide level, on a wide level. So these APYs aren't going to be here forever. They're they're actually going to be dwindling later on once more liquidity gets added in. But so it incentivizes the early adopters to you know farm these pools. But over time, it's going to stabilize because it has to. There's no way to sustainably hold 900% APY, uh, you know, for a year, right? So these these pools are going to be kind of like dripping down to another. I would say once the more liquidity comes in, you're going to start seeing a little bit less of uh, APY and also more stabilization of it as well. Uh, going back to <laughs> going back to uh, balancer as well. So. Balancer right now is still providing, you know, some of the, you know, some cool incentive rewards as well. But you can also look at like QuickSwap, for example. Uh, so if you're looking at, let's say, ETH and Matic, uh, let's see. So the wrapped ETH and wrapped Matic 50-50 right now, since it is not incentivized, is around, you know, 0.75%, um, while the ETH and Matic on this one is around 38%. So Balancer is still a little bit new, depending on if they're going to incentivize the wrapped Matic and wrapped ETH. But they still do have some, you know, pretty good rewards as well. Um, a good thing about Balancer that's pretty interesting as well is they do single-sided deposits. So let's say, for example, if you really wanted to get into, I would say, this big pool, right? Sushi, Rapmatic, USDC, uh, QI, Rapteeth, Quick Balancer, and ADDY. I don't know what the hell that is, but let's say if you wanted to kind of like go into this pool, you actually don't have to provide money or all of these assets at once. So if you go ahead and click on this one, it'll kind of lead you up to the different areas of where you want to place in. So if I wanted to place on, you know, one sushi or one Rapmatic or one balance or, you know, one USDC, you can actually place a one-sided, single-sided asset uh, deposit. So what happens is that it actually on the back end will route to however much percentage that it's going to be uh, throughout the other tokens. So if it's going to do a market buy on sushi, market buy on USDC, uh, you know, it's going to buy all of those in order to balance and rebalance itself. You know, think of the name balancer, right? It can rebalance itself in order to still keep that pegging of that percentage. So let's say if you deposit a really big amount of uh, sushi and it has to maintain its 13% pegging to the rest of the pairs, what will happen is it'll, uh, it would market by Rapmatic, Rap USD, uh, you know, USDC, QI, Rap Teeth, Quick Balancer, and ADUI in order to balance back to 13%. Uh, and also another great thing as well is like, let's say, for example, if you wanted to do a really quick swap between, I would say, three assets, right? So let's say, for example, you see that the market is crashing down and you want to exit three positions at once. So let's say, for example, if I wanted to exit <coughs> Sushi, Matic, and like Wrapped ETH or something, I can actually deposit all three into here, go to withdrawal, and then do a single token withdrawal. So I can actually withdraw all of them into USDC. It would draw that way. <clears throat> uh, the only thing about it is like you're gonna face at least a one percent dynamic swap fees right now. Um, so you're basically hitting a one percent swap fee. And if there's not enough liquidity, you're also gonna hit price impact, which is gonna be um, you know basically the the slippage of balancer as well. So if you're depositing you know a lot of value into the pool and the pool is not able to function properly, um, let's say the value of this one is around forty-three thousand dollars. So if you're doing a hundred thousand dollar, you know, sell on each asset, that's potentially going to clear the pool. But the cool thing about Balancer as well is that <clears throat> it also pulls from the other pools as well. So if you're routing from, let's say I'm selling Rapmatic and there's not enough, there's thirteen percent only on here, so there's not enough on here uh, due to the the pool value. 
it actually can pull from the other Rapmatic as well. So any other pools that have Rapmatic at a certain percentage, they can be able to route that order as well. All right, let me see. James says, do you guys have any plans to make tutorials for Absolute Noobs? Yeah, we're, we're actually going to be releasing uh, different tutorials later on uh, in order to help you guys uh, learn a little bit more about DeFi. I, I know it's very... Very crazy jumping into DeFi and was like, what the heck is happening? Like, where do I go and buy this? How do I swap to this? Um, being able to understand some of the protocols and understanding how to use them, uh, we're going to be slowly releasing them out uh, over time. Let's see, Balancer is a winner. <laughs> I want a ton. Yeah, so for a Balancer, once they rebalance their portfolio and everything, like you'll start seeing a lot of different ways to actually really help because on, on layer one, whenever you're rebalancing, especially for like a big portfolio, like you're spending a lot of money on gas fees and gas fees over time will eat up the, I would say the rebalancing function. Now, if you have something like Polygon, it can actually help a lot better because now you're able to do multiple transactions. <laughs> you're, you're able to do multiple transactions all in one batch without including that fee. Uh, think of it as like an advisor fee, right? Like every time you do a trade with a traditional bank um, or a traditional advisor, like whenever you're exiting a stock position or anything, you got to pay the advisor or pay the the person to you know, the broker submit a trade. Well, with this, it's like think of it as like doing five or six trades within one and rebalancing your portfolio within you know on Polygon, it's like less than a penny uh, in order to rebalance. Oh, hey, Justin. I think he's uh, connecting to the stream. But uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to let us know in the chat. Like we're, we're more than happy to help answer them right now for you guys. Let's see, looking back at the charts really quickly. Hey, Justin. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody, for our first uh, DeFi, uh, DeFi roundtable or DeFi uh, recap of what's been going on. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on, I guess, today and, and just overall uh, in the market. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been crazy. I kind of uh, went through some of the news with them. It was like you know, showing EIP-1559 being able to, to be implemented on testnet. Like we're going to slow, we're going to slowly start seeing Ethereum burn. And you know, <laughs> that's when the real FOMO is going to start kicking in. You know, once that burn starts happening and ETH just goes away, You'll start seeing a lot more people saying, hey, look, during times of congestion, like if some of the blocks actually make it deflationary, if there's like enough value or enough, I would say, transfers in there, like you'll start seeing, but I don't I don't think it's gonna be anytime soon. Like the burn rate is still super, super minuscule. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the test net the test net has been pushing its boundaries a little bit. We're at I think hundred and eighty seven thousand uh USD uh, USD is burned on uh, on ETH. For uh, EIP one five five nine. Yeah, I mean, like going onto testnet is is getting close to to being fully launched. I mean, it's still roughly on track. Like it's supposed to come out during July as well. So you know, we'll have to see how that goes. And then obviously we still have like Arbitrum that's still being tested out. Optimism got delayed as well too. So um, I don't see why you would ever short ETH right now. Like it's just very short sighted. Like you. We've all been with ETH at 300, 300 bucks, 500 bucks, 1500. Uh, all this price right now is just very short term and short run as well too. So it's like it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter like what the price is right now. To be honest, if you're, if you over leverage yourself, obviously, then yeah. But like, why why would you sell right now? E2, E2.0, the steps for E2.0 is coming, and you, we already know it's going to come in. In, lay, uh, in step by step progression, so we're just building up towards towards that, and each increment milestone is going to be huge for the uh, Ethereum ecosystem. Then, obviously, you know, with Polygon and others helping alleviate some of the uh, transaction by pushing it either to you know off chain as well too, or or just layer two, or some of the rollups. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity too, but uh, I think we we covered a little bit too before. Um, you know, it's. DeFi is still, and we talked about this in DeFi Summit. We won't see a DeFi summer in the core of summer. We're going to see uh, DeFi winter <laughs> in a way, or, or early next year for DeFi to really pop off. 
uh, just because of the way that the development cycles work. And that's the way that, you know, with Michael and I working in the industry and working alongside with the teams directly and listening to the developers and understanding uh, the projects that are coming on, we kind of already see what the time schedule is for that. And we already know, like, we can't be bearish, like in my opinion, because we know there's so much projects being in, in development right now. <laughs> and uh, they haven't fully all launched yet and matured. So we're so we're still so early. So why why short now? Um, obviously the hype has died, died down, but the beauty about DeFi is that there's the revenue generating, um, yield bearing and, and giving interest, even in during a, uh, a uh, boring market, I should say. But there's always new opportunities. Like we saw with last week, Osmosis just launched. It started off with like 10,000 plus APY. Still today, after a week, it's still like 1,000 plus. That's still better than a lot of other farms right now. So just follow the, the follow the foundations and roadmap. We've, we've seen farms come out of Polygon and Binance Smart Chain pop up. Well, look for the next thing, Solana Farms. Look for Cosmos Farms. Kusama, when it turns online too, with the Corora, Kusama Farms are not even here yet as well. So why are you going to short Kusama? Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. So there's there's still a lot more to to to, to come. So uh, Luna, all the airdrops are going to come in in like Q3 to Q4. So yeah, but it, like have faith, have <laughs> faith in the development. Um, it's a whole different cycle right now comparatively. You won't have it'll be just like with DeFi. It, DeFi even when DeFi summer kicked off, it didn't fully ignite the market either in the, in the way, but it still got a lot of excitement and a lot of the capital flew away from the shit coins and even boring uh boring DeFi project not DeFi, boring blockchain projects that have no they haven't found use cases and all that capital and flowed into DeFi tvl so even in during a like a bear cycle where is all the money going they're still going into all the stable coins if everybody's stabled out they can always just pump back the market in just look what happened like just yesterday like each just a, it's a big market buy. <laughs> so somebody just did a fat market buy. There, there's a lot of whales that are playing both sides of the game right now. Obviously, you look at the macro things that I, you know, obviously wasn't fully paying attention to, but obviously, like the hash rates, uh, Bitcoin and, and China mining ha is flowing out. But if you look at the time schedule now, they're the miners are incentivized to get their sh stuff back up fast because if they don't like they're they're losing all that opportunity cost to mine right right would you say so michael so a lot yeah. of people now are just like flying flying out their equipment out super fast to like kazakhstan to maryland to texas to uh even iran so they're moving quick and it might take like a month or two before we see those probably two months um to see those fully turn back online and, and that's when it starts progressing back up anyways in, in a two month time frame. Then it'll probably take a couple more months after that to get their to do a full swap over into uh into the uh the marketplace as well too. Well it's yeah. also interesting. Oh good. Yeah, even even with like the, the Bitcoin mining rate too, I mean the the difficulty rate too, it's like if they're if it's gonna drop twenty four percent of difficulty, that means you're saving like let's say depending on what your competition was before. You know, you're saving on electricity costs, right? Like, because you're you're able to mine a lot more efficiently, a lot more uh, less difficult. The only thing is, is that you know the a lot more miners are gonna, of course, try to jump in. But if you look at it as well, it's like whoever's gonna be the first mover, whoever's gonna switch over from you know from China that's getting out of their farms right now, are gonna be the first incentive. You know, the first I would say like push forward, right? They're gonna be really incentivized because like they want to get it quickly done because the the less that they're gonna have to spend, you know, on top of that, like getting all their operations down and everything. Like if they're going to places with like cheaper electricity or even, you know, places that are gonna be more, I would say, you know, friendly for mining, mm -hmm. those guys are now incentivized to like, hey, hurry up, get your, <laughs> you know, get your machines right back on. What's up? Oh, no, no, I was saying like the, the miners are now incentivized. Oh, to yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And you know, looking at, at the miners as well too, right? Like, um, uh, was it who was making the ASIC ships? Ships again? Was it uh, Bitman and, and all guys? Ant. Yeah, and like they they uh, they actually stopped selling, so that you know, obviously the price was sliding like insane. So they they kind of did an artificial price freeze because they they made it like they're, they're making supply 
of those minor equipment um, super scarce as well too. In the long-term scope of things, even the mid to long-term scope, the fact that this is actually a blessing in disguise, if you think about it, all the miners moving away from China means there can't be any China, China FUD anymore. Like China <laughs> is out of the picture. So who cares? It's actually decentralized. That was the biggest issue with like Peter Thiel and all these, uh, even Elon Musk is like, they all like, was Bitcoin used or could be used as a uh, asset for uh, economic takeover from China? It definitely could have because all the miners was just like chilling in China. But right now with the way that, you know, the reason why China kind of like stopped the mining is because they're not, one, they're not really reaping all the benefits. The government, the CCP wasn't really reaping all the governments, right? Obviously they're not collecting as much tax because they, they can hide away all the Bitcoins. But two, it was just draining so much energy that the country needs for real real stuff, for real real things, right? So they need to progress further uh, in, in their country and, and they have other, other stuff to worry about instead of like crypto money that, it's still like a fraction of like the whole world market. Like they don't really care to do that. So I see it as a, a, a amazing thing. Like we can't have China, China <laughs> fun anymore. Like we really can't like after, after this move. Yeah. Like all, um, all the, every single cycle, like every single bull run, you're like China fun, China's, yeah, China's fun been around since 2014. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, when I first got into the space, man, like China is like banning Bitcoin when Bitcoin market cap or crypto market cap was like, 100 mil or less, man. And we were freaking out already at that point. And then they come back, back and forth, back and forth again. Like, who cares? Let's, let's, let's dump China. They've been dumping on us every, uh, every, uh, every uh, afternoon or evening anyway. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's like the innovation and money is going to flow elsewhere as, as always. Uh, all that money is uh, exiting and they're getting ahead of it. Obviously, that's going to drop the hash rate in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the short term. And yeah, I'm, I'm saying with you, James, I'm, I'm happy this happens. Obviously it, it's, it's max pain right now. Um, but we're still at Bitcoin 30 K for now, which is still higher than it was like <laughs> even in January or February, uh, February levels. So, uh, I'm still, still super bullish. Let's see, Michael, who are you bullish on in the DeFi space? All I'll let DeFi. you go first. <laughs> All of DeFi. Like if you look at like the, the different instruments that have already been, you know, placed down, a lot of people say like the DeFi Lego blocks, right? You have the lending, you have the insurance, but like if you look at the actual market cap of DeFi, it's super small compared to like the traditional finance sector. So if you're looking at more, there, there is going to be more competition. Um, I, I'm, I'm just bullish within the DeFi space in, in like in whole. Um, of course, there are going to be a lot of like, different companies that are coming out and like shit coins that are coming out. But, um, you know, like with that as well, it's like, you'll start seeing kind of like, even like uh, what they say, like the blue chips of DeFi. Yeah. They drop too, man. Like compound drop, Aave drop, everything drops. Right. But it's all tied to kind of like how the market sentiment is. Um, just curious if you had a favorite, I technically don't have a favorite. Um, the reason for that is because think of them as like different financial instruments, right? Do you have a favorite insurance company for a car? Do you have a favorite, you know, uh, exchange that you use? Like, no, I, I'm, I'm, the type of, I'm the type of person that's always wanting to look for arbitrages. So let's say, for example, if I need to go on to SushiSwap one day, right? Because the SushiSwap rates are better. Yeah, I'm going to go on to SushiSwap. It's decentralized. I don't have to stick with one protocol. I can go on to Uniswap if I want to. I want to go into any other protocols too. Um, so for me, it's it, it's synthetics versus mirror. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll let Justin go, go next uh, before I answer that one. Justin, you're on mute. So yeah, synthetics versus mirror. That's an easy one. We'll talk about that right after. after this <laughs> so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll chime in and, and say, uh, similar things to Michael. Obviously I'll share my thoughts on which DeFi projects protocols I'm looking at as well. Uh, yeah, right now I would say like, I'm, I'm chain agnostic as well. Like the fact that I was just like burnt out from all the BSC poo coins that I wasn't <laughs> paying attention to Polygon, even though Polygon was an easy easy choice. Same with even Binance Smart Chain was an easy thing to kind of take a look at the direction of where things were heading at. And if you were just sitting on the sidelines, because let's say you hate centralization with CZ or you, you hate Polygon for whatever reason, because it's not an Ethereum, true Ethereum layer two, like leave your biases aside. There's opportunities all across the board with early farms. Who cares about the chain? When, when you already know me, like I already, I already have my gripes with uh, Cardano, but Will I chase it for the gains as well for the short term when Cardano DeFi turns online? Yeah, for sure. And Binance Smart Chain was definitely, you know, scam city and all that stuff too. But could you make your gains and farm crazy with the APY? 
yeah, you could. Obviously, there's a lot of rug pulls that happen and, and whatnot, but it's happening now. It, it's, it, Polygon isn't even safer. It, it just happens on everything. E Ethereum wasn't safe. Ethereum had all the rug pulls, right? <laughs> what's, what's new with you calling out like Binance Smart Chain having rug pulls? It's just people are doing it, I guess, faster because there's less fees, I guess, and people are aping in more faster. But like, we were we were all getting rug pulled left and right in Ethereum. Like, let's be honest as well. And you could have called Ethereum as a, a scam DeFi chain as well, right? Like, how much people got lost so much money from that too? So, yeah, in terms of like what I'm looking at right now, obviously, like I've been doing, I've been going into Cosmos DeFi. I think that Cosmos DeFi is still in infancy. Osmosis just launched last week. Um, Osmosis is not the biggest DeFi project either for uh, for Cosmos. Cosmos and the Tendermint team. Tendermint is the development group behind Cosmos. Um, they're launching an official DEX uh, and swap and bridge called Gravity DEX that's coming out sometime in July or August. And it's funny enough, like we we tried to get them on. Uh, we we did get the CEO of Cosmos onto our show. Um, and uh, and then also other Cosmos people as well too. I keep bringing on Os Osmosis as just like because Osmosis is the first thing that's launching right now, right? Um, and they keep uh, sidestepping and just keep pushing my attention to Gravity, and and so that just shows though that Gravity is going to be way bigger than uh, Osmosis because obviously if, if the, the the developers of Chain is shilling and pushing all their energy to that that marketing uh, event, then uh, then it's gonna it's gonna be huge. Uh, TVL for Osmosis, I think it's about sixty billion. Not sixty. Is it sixty billion? I think it's about sixty billion. I have to double check. Um, not sixty billion. Um, sixty million. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Osmosis is still fairly young. So it's still, right it's still small, but that's that's not bad. Again, like nobody, people still haven't gone on Cosmos DeFi as well, too, right? So, uh, so I'm looking forward to um, Gravity Dex. And then I'm also looking forward towards the Gravity Bridge. And then um, and then one of the other speakers, too, that we had, Yumi. Uh, let me do a quick share screen as well, too, while we're at it. Uh, everybody's chatting here as well. Where's my Yumi? Can't find my screen. Give me one quick sec, guys. Yeah, let me let me answer the uh, synthetics versus mirror question. So synthetics versus mirror. Now you, you got to look at mirror and synthetics on. They're, they're both on both chains, right? So mirror is more on the Terra side. Synthetics is on the Ethereum side. But for that too, it's like whichever one provides the better, I would say, instruments for the users, right? I want to trade Apple. I want to trade Facebook. I want to trade you know Netflix, Amazon, whatever stock it is. It doesn't have to be just U.S. stocks as well. It can also be other stocks and stuff. But you have to do it in a way where you know where your users uh, really, really want those things. Right, you, you want to do it in a way where your users really want to have, you know, different products. So I, I would say between those two, whichever one actually wins it out is going to be the one that's going to provide more use cases or more utility for the users. Right, if I'm going to be stuck saying, hey, look, if Synthetics doesn't offer this, I'm going to go to Mir. Of course, if Mir doesn't offer this, I'm going to go to Synthetics. So they're, they're both synthetic protocols that are based off of, you know, Oracle pricing. So any protocol can actually do that with an Oracle price feed. What I'll say about this is that, you know, I've been following uh, the Luna ecosystem super closely. Same with Mirror. Because I've been following Mirror super closely, then I've been following the overall synthetics marketplace as well, because uh, there's not very many options out there. Um, you have SNX. Uh, you also have, there's, there's a few other ones as well, too, that are like Yuma protocol and then like a few other ones as well. Um, if you just look at by the numbers, Mirror blows synthetics out of the water in terms of like revenue, volume, uh, assets, etc. And but and synthetics has all that Ethereum hype. It just goes to show though, like with synthetics right now, because it's Ethereum based and the community, the valuation for synthetics is SNX is super high. But are actually people using it? Hell no! Like it's it's on Ethereum. Like why would you want to run synthetics like trading um, on Ethereum? Like it should have been on Polygon if anything right now, but they're not on Polygon yet, to, to my understanding. They're so switching to the, going to Optimism. Oh uh, well, they're waiting for Optimism. Okay, well, cool, cool story. It's like <laughs> yeah, like the thing about Mirror is that Mirror is built into the Luna ecosystem pretty pretty closely in terms of like the airdrops. Uh, in terms of like the stable coins as well too, 
it's one thing to build just like the synthetics as well too, right? But the thing about Mirror is it has the um, the UST um, to build off of and build the APY and better better like they have Mirror 2.0 just that just that just dropped recently as well. Um, they also lowered the uh, collateral rate and you could do some really interesting things from like um, earning interest from just being part of some of these uh, uh, synthetic pools with like GameStop and Microsoft and all these other things as well too. So the beauty about this is when you pick some, like a synthetic pair like Microsoft, Microsoft has just been a, a, a very slow gainer, but you know it, you're not gonna really hit, in my opinion, a lot of impermanent loss because it doesn't really dip at all um, in terms of Microsoft. But imagine being able to get 80% APY on top of just holding uh, UST and Microsoft pair. <laughs> you're going to do way better than the Microsoft dividends even as well too. And so you're getting paid in a, a dividend-like experience with UST stablecoin payout as well with Mirror. So just look at the go, look at the math. Uh, I, I don't have the, the, the links handy, but if you go look at like what's happening on um, – on, uh, uh, mirror protocol and synthetics. There, there was a thread about this. I have to go dig it up later. But um, mirror blows out synthetics. I think synthetics is overvalued. Uh, I think that uh, mirror is undervalued. Another one that I'm, I'm keeping uh, close watch of is linear finance and liquify the liquify team and linear finance. But I do think that they have a lot more to develop as well. They're also Ethereum based too, so they're going to hit that issue. Um, early on and and also too we had them on the interview and um, they said that the stocks and equities wasn't their main focus I personally think that is the wrong initial approach because stocks hits the Robin Hood crowd and that's the easiest selling point for synthetics nobody is going to go buy synthetic rubies or synthetic gold or silver because it's not like the, the Trojan horse into synthetics at all. It's not an asset that we normally buy anyways, but where are we buying GM, GME and G AMC? Yeah, oh, we, yeah. we are. <laughs> like, so, again, like that, that, that's where I see the pitfall for some of these um, synthetic coins as well. They're trying to jump straight to commodities or, or some other play. And like the only road to DeFi right now, and this is why I love right now, like Akala or Yumi or these like DeFi hubs or DeFi bridges like Luna is that they're trying to bridge fintech uh, with uh, with DeFi, so traditional finance, fintech, and DeFi all together to get the mass adoption. That's going to be similar to what NBA Top Shots did for NBA. We're not there yet, and that's what makes me still bullish about this in in the space is that if we have a, a way for you to just camp your money and pull it out from your savings account and push it into DeFi immediately without jumping through this hoops of USDC, jumping to multiple wallets, and then transfer to UST to then anchor 20% APY, right? Like that, the barrier right now is, is still huge. But the moment we can get it to be like straight from fiat to anchor instant 20% APY, then you're, the floodgates will open up, and that's what's happening. It's going to take over. It's going to take some time because of both uh, regulation, both integrations with uh, banks. Whenever you're trying to execute that type of level integration with uh, any type of market, you're going to have to get your banking relationships in place. You have to have some sort of UST or UST uh, custody as well too. So when people are needing redemption in in, in US dollar, you got to have somebody that somebody be able to redeem it in that local marketplace, whether it be in Nigeria, Philippines for remittance, you have to have those like pathways all set up. And so the concept is there. The the gateways need to be set up no different than how we were setting up the Coinbase's or Binance uh, uh, on ramps. We need the on ramps for DeFi. We're not there yet. It's been a year only. That's coming in the next year. And the moment that happens, we're going to see uh, NBA top shot level like adoption and when when that happens like tvl is going to go through the roof <laughs> yeah like we, we've seen with like how nba chop shots enables like credit cards right but like you know that that allows for the i'll say the consumers a lot of a easier experience in order to buy you know nfts and crypto but if you look at it like from like how compound is doing it as well like compound just said that they're releasing their treasury to have, you know, hopefully institutional DeFi, like what the hell is institutional DeFi, right? But having institutional DeFi gives you more liquidity 
from a centralized perspective, right? The centralized people, the centralized players want to enter the space. They want to provide their liquidity into these pools. But at the same time, it's like if you're not able to have, you know, meet their meet their requirements, they're not going to put money in there. Like, no way are you going to go up to a hedge fund manager and be like, "Hey, look, I, can I put, you know, two million dollars into into uh, you know a decentralized application?" They're going to be like, "Oh, what security risk are there? Are we going to lose money? Like, what's 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 going to happen?" So once those you know once those products do roll out, that's when you'll start seeing more liquidity within the system, and then that's when you'll start seeing more. I would say arbitrage rates as well, right? Because now you have you're you're competing against institutions to kind of get this APY, get this yield. And if you're looking at like a traditional banking account, if you have you know you deposit money into a savings account, right? Your savings account generates you what on a high end like two percent APY. But for a lot of people, that's stable yield. Like they rather have that two percent than to go on and risk permanent loss and stuff like that. But the the beauty of stable coins is that you know depending on which stable coins you use, of course we talked about. Uh, you know, safe dollar going to zero. Potentially, that's a, that's a stable coin that went to zero. But you want to go with like some of these more vetted ones, like USDC, USDT, Dai. Like me personally, I love Dai compared to all the other ones. I think USDC and USDT don't have a competitive edge compared to Dai, but they do have that institutional edge, right? They're able to get a lot of the fiat liquidity onto uh, into DeFi through that factor. But Dai, Dai is under collateralized, so you can have a lot more of crypto based backed instead of having it rely on you know an intermediary. Um, but you know, once again, USDC and USDT, they they are good, um, you know, good to have within the ecosystem because they can onboard a lot of liquidity. But at the same time, they're not decentralized. So if you're placing them within DeFi protocols, you have to understand the risks. Like we've seen Yearn Finance get hacked, and what happened was, you know, the uh, uh, Tether actually froze the funds for uh, through that attack. You know, they froze. I think it was like 25 million dollars from the hacker. But if you do it with Dai, there's no way you're getting back. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Christopher had a question. Is there a way to solve that problem? The rug pulls, uh, maybe my wallet addresses. And I think this one was pertaining earlier when we were talking about rug pulls within the ecosystems, right? Now, what happens if I just create another wallet, right? That just now, now, how do you know it's me? Uh, so the, the thing about rug pulls, like there's no way to prevent them because the, the way that you onboard applications onto Ethereum, Binance, Smart Chain, Polygon is like, it's through a decentralized network. Um, I mean, there are ways to kind of find out like who hacked you and stuff like that and kind of like find out where the, the flow of money goes. But once it goes into like a mixer or stuff like that, like it kind of goes into like an you know, anonymous type of phase, like a black hole um, to kind of like do analysis on it, right? Like what happens if that wallet interacted with 100 different wallets? Now, are all those wallet comprised? So it, it just depends on how you how you do it. But rug pulls are always going to be there. So just be very careful whenever you're, you know, looking into projects and stuff like that, because there's always you, you can create another wallet address like, like that. You can just within two seconds create another uh, wallet address. Yeah, like it's never a thing that the the way that people are, are changing now is that DeFi projects, at least the legit ones, are becoming less anonymous. They're putting their name behind it. They're backed by Silicon Valley uh, projects in terms of maintaining the protocol. And so that just shows like, again, the maturity of the space right now it used to be all anons and Pepe frogs that are running the game and, and launching your favorite food token, right? But now we're seeing like uh, Anderson Horowitz back companies, Coinbase Ventures, we're seeing FinTech companies starting to partner with uh, these DeFi projects and protocols as well too. Um, same with the compound compound at least is, is backed by a lot of, uh, heavyweights as well too. And so, yeah, we're, we're seeing a little bit more maturity now with people wanting more legitimate teams behind it. That doesn't guarantee that these, this team won't run pull, but there's, there are consequences now where if they were to do that, they would be able to like get arrested or be fined now, even if they were to do it in a decentralized network, um, as well too. So. We're seeing that quick maturity come into the play. We're seeing teams reveal themselves a little bit better. They're separating from the crowd a little bit more because of uh, because of the people that are behind it. Then the other way too is just you know audit code also doesn't mean as much too because there could be multiple smart contracts involved. All of them off to have to be audited. And then again, there's different types of rug pulls. There's like a soft rug pull too where they the the, the, the token project itself has a lot of tokens and then they just drain. The full bank account, um, not even attacking like the minter function or like some other like smart contract hack as well. They were doing it in the legit gray hat way of like draining their own um, their own pools as well too. So if you're really trying to like 
figure it out against it, then you're going to need to like, you know, audit the code, look at the token economics, um, dive, dive deep into it to really kind of see what's, what's going on um, into that as well, too. And then uh, Chris had another question. So I was like, I don't get the point of tokenized stocks, except for the fact that it's not on a bank network or whatever, decentralized, right? So for, I guess I would say like tokenized stocks, like tokenized stocks, okay, so you can actually have the value of uh, so for this for synthetics it's just the value of the price so you're not trading on the authenticity of owning that stock you don't, you don't care about the stock because you only care about the pricing of that stock right even with like mirror and synthetics like you never have full custody of that stock the only thing is it's just another market so basically like a derivatives market to where you can trade the value of this through a decentralized manner right you can buy facebook but you're technically only buying that stock that's following that Right? You're, you're basically buying a token that's following that stock in terms of price. So the price usually fluctuates and balances itself within a pool. So if Facebook goes up 1%, you know, of course, within a decentralized network, your token price is supposed to go up a little bit more for that as well. Now for, you know, if you're looking at other, like, okay, that's just like stocks. Same thing goes for like commodities, same thing goes for like anything else. Like I can say, hey, look, I'm going to have a, even for like a, during like a, um, the presidential election as well, FTX released a Biden token and a Trump token. So what happens? Like one of them is going to actually end up at a dollar. They're not stocks. Like you're not buying, you know, I'm not buying the president. I'm not buying the, the, the running up candidate, right? I'm buying a, a mirror of what the representation of that value is going to be for that token. So if Facebook token is supposed to be, you know, keeping the pairing, if it doesn't, it presents a either A, an arbitrage opportunity, uh, within the, the decentralized network, or B, it provides that this pairing is not able to update properly. So if it's not updating properly to the price, depending on what oracles it use, right? If it's only using, I would say, pricing data from one, one exchange, right? What happens if that exchange goes down? So now my price of my token is going to be zero. And even though it's, you know, follow back, you know, I'm trying to buy Facebook, but there's only one price feed. Uh, so what usually for um, synthetics and a lot of the different synthetic platforms is that they use multiple price oracles and then balance it out to round out the number so that you're not getting uh, too much of a deviation for that. But you're, you're technically, you're not having any custodial ownership of it. What I'll say about uh, tokenized stocks is it allows a lot of, it's a, it's a new financial uh, tool and, and vehicle for uh, accessibility um, and into uh, assets that normally weren't liquid or yeah not liquid or accessible by many people around the world uh if you think about it too so let me go through like a few very quick bullet points the the idea about synthetics whether it be for stocks uh for commodities uh for any other asset whether it be lumber ruby whatever it is think about it right now ruby like you have to have the physical asset to be able to trade i don't even think it's like think there's like a commodities market for ruby for example and if you could, if somebody has custody of it, trusted custody, of course, whether you believe on it, that's a whole nother story. But if somebody has custody of that asset or collateral in this case for synthetics, because they're not actually backed by anything, then at the very least, there's still like proof of value being held somewhere. And you're essentially creating like a coupon, in this case, a tokenized coupon that represents that asset. So then when you want to go trade or hold that value for whatever reason it is, then you can go ahead and do so freely. And then you can jump between both that asset and crypto if you want to trade for BTC, ETH, stablecoin, without with a simple click, 24/7 even. Then you can go ahead and do so. Imagine when Robinhood shut down um, because of the whatever lag or the SEC uh, kind of like uh, brought it all down, right? Well, or even like the the closing bell, stock stops trading, right? Well, not in the crypto land, and so. It allows people to trade off hours for whatever reason. If you if you're if you go if you don't wake up in time or you still want exposure to the asset, but also too, how many people like in Africa can buy a Microsoft stock easily? Can tap into Nasdaq and still reap the the gains and rewards of the Microsoft of kind of being owning a Microsoft stock or buying into Tesla, for example. How much could that change their life when they bought Tesla? If they could have bought Tesla at the earliest stages through a synthetic crypto. Because again, they couldn't register for a NASDAQ account, New York Stock Exchange account, et cetera, or a brokerage account, TD or Ameritrade, et cetera, as well too, right? Um, but they do have crypto, right? Uh, or stable coins. So what it's down is it's financial inclusion and accessibility, in my opinion, 
um, if we can get everybody to get into these synthetic stocks, then they can reap the benefits of that. And on top of that, even earn more because of the uh, the lending of those assets or uh, get earning yield from them as well too. So that's my biggest point about synthetics, why I love it. I think it, it is a Trojan horse to uh, unlocking a lot a lot of money uh, for for everybody that's coming into the, the space. And hopefully that answers your, your question. Yeah, and then we have another one from uh, Das Das334. Thoughts on growing Solana ecosystem, short term versus long term? Uh, so Solana had the Solana season hackathon um, turn online. Um, we also saw a lot of Solana airdrops and some DeFi products come, come to light. Uh, but right now, still, I believe that Solana is still missing those like killer dApps and applications, even if their, their platform and protocol has, uh, what's it called, uh, a lot of uh, projects being built on it, there just hasn't been as much adoption and use case quite yet. So I'm hoping that with the Solana hackathon, we're going to see at least like a few projects come out there. You might only need one killer dApp or project come out, um, so to speak. So they just ended up their hackathon. So that means like the new ideas that came on board were are still fresh. They're not matured yet. I would like to see Solana mature a little bit more. Uh, because Solana is backed by uh, SPF, uh, Sam Bankman Fried uh, from uh, FTX, it's going nowhere. Long term scope, Solana, I think, is going to still exist and it's going to be a contender to to host interesting transaction with with fast throughput. And we'll see what happens, uh, uh, happens from there. But right now, because there isn't there hasn't been that killer adapt that's been meaningful, then the only thing you can really chase right now is maybe some like DeFi farms and DeFi uh, projects that are coming um, early on as well, too. That's, that's all I have to say. There's another one from Chris. How do I get involved with the crypto company and get work in crypto space? Uh, I, I actually have a link for this. Hold on, let me. So while you find that find that link, yeah, Crypto Jobs is another one. Crypto Careers, you want to pull that up as well too. Both really, really great websites. So I, I had a chat with um, um, uh, somebody at the DeFi Summit group as well um, the other day, and he was asking me about this too. How do you just jump right into it? Obviously, sometimes when you look at some of these job descriptions too, right? They require you to have crypto knowledge, sort of. But I'll tell you a reality. There's a shortage of talent and there's a shortage of man manpower behind a lot of these jobs. If you are spending day in, day out learning DeFi, you're going to be ahead of even the blockchain crowd. There's only like less than 10 percent or more or, or less that of people that are DeFi knowledgeable. So if you get into DeFi farming, you start understanding lending, even if you don't understand all blockchain in general, or if you have a, like a finance fintech or understand like how the financial markets work, banking, etc. If you don't go learn it as well too. be that bridge between fintech, traditional finance and fintech, you're still good. You're going to stand out beyond just the crypto normal blockchain person that's launching their meme coins that, that have no real use <laughs> case as well. You go to a lot of these crypto companies, even the people that work inside of there still don't. We, me, Michael and I have been with working with so many companies in the past before we, we, we asked how is the CMO in this position? He doesn't even know what they're doing like they've had no previous experience before too so go pick up a book um roll roll up your sleeves just the fact that you're already in DeFi already gives you a huge edge you are in the bleeding edge compared to like everybody else in DeFi right now so if you want to skip the line and you can work your way backwards and understanding layer two and how it relates to DeFi, etc using DeFi as your core template to to really build off of and then tee off of there. Are you a good artist? Then be like a DeFi artist, build some DeFi NFT art or, or find some DeFi play, build some assets and design for them. Are you a good copywriter? Cool. We'll start writing some some uh, examples of like how tutorials even just to start as well. Uh, if you're marketing, then cool. Like start applying your skill sets for marketing. Now, how to actually jump into the space? That might be a little bit daunting, right? Because you can't really apply into companies early on and say, hey, I don't I have no experience. They might not accept you. There's one reality where it's like the, the roll up your sleeves way. You might have to just jump into one opportunity for like a month, either for like low pay or pro bono. Uh, that obviously sucks. But what I'll say is this, is that you just want to build your DeFi badge and, and portfolio up even for just like one or two months. That's already, that's already veteran status almost in, in DeFi. Just think about it, right? Two months will happen in, in the whole crypto line. So you might need to just jump into it like with, 
something that's low cost. And I did this in other industries as well too. Like I had no experience in DeFi. Well, I just jumped and found some opportunities. I hit up the CEO, I hit up the marketers. Hey, you know what? I have this experience. I really want to learn. Let me intern. Let me just build up my portfolio. You only need to stay for like one or two months to be honest. And then after that, you can, you can jump to another thing and just be like, Hey, you know what? Like I work with X, X farm or DeFi. I have this DeFi knowledge before I'm looking for new opportunities. It's this, this DeFi project's not working out. Would you want to work for the next job? They don't know. You don't have to tell your next company after that you jumped over that you didn't get paid or like whatever the deal was to their knowledge, you got the experience and that's all you need to, do, to punch yourself into the industry. If you're looking for like a, a, a roll up your sleeves, like, you know, sweat equity type of, uh, of role. And that's, that's a way that I would get in. If you have zero crypto experience uh, at all, if you want to go the reverse way again, I still believe that there are companies still that are, have a massive shortage in talent, just still hit them up with your skill sets, whatever it is. And if you don't have those skill sets, then I would just say like spend like a few, like a month or two, just sharpen up your skill sets. If it's development, if it's coding, website, UI, UX, hone in your skill sets first before getting domain knowledge and then go into the domain knowledge or learn along as your way um, to get into the space as well too. So um, yeah, again, like a lot of these DGENs, like they don't have big experience in 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 the big fintech world. They they were just DGEN enough to, to get a job and um, that's always how it is in any nascent uh, industry. Just look at esports too. Look at the people working in esports. They're not professional. They didn't work in corporate. They were just playing games and then they got into esports. The same thing with DeFi. If you've been in DeFi farms, uh, you got skin in the game already. If you got rug pulled, that's your that's your universe. That's your bachelor's degree right there. You, you, graduate, you graduate once you get rug pulled, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as well too. So that's 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 just my quick take on that as well too. Yeah, I'm like, dude, just if you guys are looking at getting into DeFi, get your hands dirty. Put it, put in a little bit of money, go into some of these DeFi protocols, yeah. learn how it works. You know, go onto Compound, go onto Aave, go onto, you know, a decentralized exchange, go onto an insurance protocol, go onto like all these things. Just jump in, you know, like even if it's on, you know, Ethereum or whatever blockchain, right? Like you want to slowly get your knowledge and then uh, <laughs> BS degree in rug pool, man, <laughs> got a master's. <laughs> Well, yeah. Yeah. We, Michael and I collectively lost like Ivy League <laughs> of one year. Or Maybe a doctorate's degree, <laughs> man. Like, yeah, so like learning from these things as well is like if you, you never actually like learn it until you actually experience it, right? Like, how do you understand what a DeFi protocol does, right? What do you, rec uh, Chris says, what do you recommend to learn? All right, first thing that I recommend you to learn is setting up a MetaMask, setting up a wallet learning how Ethereum works, right? Learning how Binance Smart Chain works, how Polygon works. Like how does a block get submitted? What happens to orphan blocks? What happens within the block, right? That's like the basic fundamentals of what blockchain is because like if you're, DJ, if, you know, you're going into a lot of these different protocols and stuff, but you don't understand the core foundation, it's like, why are you using blockchain? You don't understand the core fundamentals of blockchain. The reason that blockchain is there, how is the network secured? Uh, how are the blocks submitted? Who are you know mining it? How are you mining it? How are you submitting the transactions? What are included within these transactions? Like what are the hashes and stuff like that? If you learn how to read all those small things, you're able to understand the blockchain at its core. And then from there, start using you know decentralized finance products. Like use a use a uh, you know decentralized exchange to do a swap. You start seeing how you know how to swap two assets, right? But then on top of that, if you're using a DEX, like how does the DEX work? Right? What's the ins and outs of it? What happens if I provide liquidity instead? How does that transaction volume go back to me? How does that, you know, what happens with impermanent loss or, you know, gains and stuff like that? Like, how does that work? Same thing for an insurance protocol. How does an insurance protocol work? Like, you want to dive into these things and actually read some of the white papers and even, you know, dive in, into it further. Like, if I do lending right now, how, do you know how to get the APY? Like, does that APY come out of thin air? No, it comes from people that are borrowing from you. You know, so if there's no one borrowing from your liquidity pair and you're providing liquidity, you're not going to get any money. Um, you can still technically farm APY, right? But it's not a very profitable one because like people are just going to camp it. People are just going to push it in. So let's say, for example, if I have a million dollars and I put it into compound on USDC, but no one's borrowing from me, my, my capital is not being utilized. So what's going to happen is that I will still receive compound in, in terms of tokens. But compounds not making any money, so technically my yield is zero, right? Because no one's utilizing the protocol. So 
I guess uh, <laughs> I guess for that too, it's kind of like looking into some of these other protocols and seeing how they actually work, and seeing how actually money is generated. If a company doesn't produce revenue, then y your yield is non-existent, right? Um, another place that you want also want to look at too, as well, is like if you really really want to learn a lot of it, is that we also have a Telegram group. So you can go to t.me slash DeFi Summit. And in there, you know, if you have questions and we're not on the live stream, we're, we're more than happy to help you answer, right? The the purpose of DeFi Summit in the beginning was to kind of, um, you know, we, we had this concept of giving free information for the public, right? People didn't understand DeFi. People didn't really understand like what, what the hell DeFi is. And like, they didn't see how big the scope of DeFi is. And we really wanted to have it to where it's free for you. Like education should be free, value should be free. Like, why are you, paying some shady guy is like, hey, look, take my course. You're going to learn, you know, you're going to learn how to be a DeFi degen in one week. No, man, just just do it yourself. Like, <laughs> you know, watch some videos on YouTube. Like there's been a million, I'm pretty sure there's like a million YouTube videos about how to utilize Uniswap, how to utilize Compound, how to get onto Aave and stuff. You know, information should be free. So, uh, you know, just if you have questions, you know, feel free to join our group and just ask away. Like we're not going to charge you. Um, same thing as a summit too, like all of our videos, if you go onto our YouTube channel right now, um, you can look at all the previous videos. Uh, <laughs> you look at all the previous videos to kind of see like where, like separate into like different things as well. Yeah, I'd say like, um, and also too, like we're, we're planning to host uh, this live stream at least like two to three times a week now. And we're gonna do D, uh, DeFi recaps every single day, like what's trending, what's coming up, and then also answer your questions as well uh, that you wanna uh, port over as well too. So uh, feel free to just like reach out um, and, and just subscribe as well too. If you haven't subscribed, um, you can expect this Monday, Wednesday, and potentially Friday as well too. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll start that out uh, for the week. Uh, we'll also invite a lot of different guests Sometimes it'll be different themes as well too. Sometimes it's gonna be like Cosmos week, Polkadot week. Um, we'll give you a lot of different perspectives. Um, we'll have guest speakers too in the future. Let's say like something's super trending at that at this time, then um, you know, then we'll bring on. We'll try to bring on those guest speakers to to come on on board as well too. Yeah, like for for us, it's all about freedom of information. You know, you really want to have it to where it's broken down in an easy phase so that you can learn. Because the more people that are getting into DeFi, the better it is for us because now we have a whole network, right? We have more people that are within DeFi to kind of secure it and also be able to help one another as well. Like I didn't know crap when I was joining DeFi. I just dove right in, put my head down, went onto Uniswap, started utilizing it, started going onto Compound, like all these things. Like no one was there to teach me and hold my hand. And I think that a lot of people want handholding. And if you want handholding, it's gonna you're not gonna get my yield. Like I'm gonna get the alpha before you because I'm I'm already integrated with this. And I'm already looking at a lot of these different protocols, right? If you don't understand the basic fundamentals or the basic foundation, you know, uh, ask. That's that's the the only thing that you have to do. Is you just ask. You can ask for information. You can, you know, uh, look up educational sources and everything. Um, I think there's another. Let's see if you. Let's see, just yeah, what, what, what I'll say too. <laughs> what I'll say too is this. Okay, like when I left crypto in. Uh, what's it called last year. And uh, then I came back, I was working in pure FinTech. And then when DeFi summer started happening, I was sitting on the sidelines still. And I was like, shit, I feel so outdated. This stuff is moving so fast. So then what did I do? I actually quit working on pure FinTech to jump back right in, um, especially for crypto. I was like, this is, this is a whole different wave. Again, what I even saw in 2017 or even 2014 when I first got into the space, this is my third wave essentially that I saw and it, it gets, keeps getting bigger and bigger. What did I do during that time? Like, honestly, like there was no guide for anything. Like I just started spending two months, seven days, almost seven days a week, even weekends, just learning about DeFi. There was no guides. I just started farming myself, jumping into all these different food tokens, understanding what was going on in the lending, uh, decentralized uh, leverage, etc., cetera, synthetics. Um, I, I spent two months just pull, just, just been studying DeFi and just went all in on it. Obviously, you know, you got might have a you know, different job and, and other focus too, but like if you want to get caught up in what I knew about this, and this is where like when I jumped into crypto too, is this, 
if you are in the forefront too of of getting that alpha and that knowledge you're going to be so much more valuable and that's what i knew if i were to, that's why i put in like two months worth of like day in day out like learning non-stop of DeFi, watching every single video understanding what's happening in different protocols and then i became i'm, I'm you know we're now i start understanding the alpha better than i'm ready ahead of more than like 10 percent of the the whole blockchain crowd if even you um, start seeing the trends like after yeah, a you while. Start seeing the trends and it, it's all repeatable platform uh pattern because it all has to follow the same exact way of how eth DeFi came to be i bought DeFi summit.com almost like three years ago when when i learned about DeFi initially and it wasn't ready yet and the only DeFi that was back then was compound okay and it was making like five to eight percent apy uh off your stable coins whatever but i thought it was cool though at that time because it was a decentralized block in a way where like i said screw you block by block by stuff anyways <laughs> it was a centralized celsius too you're not going to kyc me compound this is amazing i can i can lend from my my own wallet provide liquidity etc and earn that interest and that already beat the the bank account right and so but that took a couple of years to then hit DeFi summer in terms of getting like a full inflection point as well too so you got to go back and just take a look at like what were the steps that that brought ethereum DeFi um uh to to play you got the uh primitives it's like ave uh compounds maker they're very boring small stable interest that's the core of it every protocol that launched has to have that then you go out to the, all the others you know then when they first launched as well too you're going to have all the shit coins or the the farm coins with high apy rate whatever it's going to get people super excited airdrops etc osmosis token airdrop whatever that's the same exact thing when polka dot comes out it's going to happen when Kurara on kusama comes out it's going to happen when cardano uh, turns on the smart contracts opens their chain as well too and pos i think is already happening but that's going to happen as well then whatever chain comes next i don't really care but same exact thing repeats itself and you can really go back in time you can take a look at solana solana shitcoin farms came out binance smart chain shitcoin farms came out polygon next you're gonna see like optimism and arbitrum stuff come out as well too so first to market and first to farm being the first farm in those places first liquidity is gonna give you this huge alpha and huge thing and you can really predict and, and find about um you know Everybody wants to be the Ave of Solana, the Ave of Polkadot. So go and chase and find those projects. Find all the players that's building that those roadmap, those those uh, 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 those yeah those uh, road roadmap and um, road roads in place for the foundations, and then go into those projects, play around with it, find out who the team, obviously go through your whole diligence. Then from there, as you keep going to do it. Your diligence will also just increase as well too because you, you already see the play the playbook so that's how we're always seeing the markets now and then you can kind of see how that's why when cosmos DeFi turned online i jumped on it immediately i already know what's going to happen first liquidity uh a high apy rate uh i was getting like a couple thousand dollars a day on first apy uh farms that came out so was able to easily capitalize on that and there's going to be more opportunities like that as well yeah then the, once again chris is like if you want educational source that we'd recommend is we're gonna be biased just subscribe to the channel <laughs> and also look at like our previous videos as well as like we have 32 hours of nft and DeFi content so if you really want to dive into it you can look at our previous conference that was just uh, about like a week or, or two weeks ago um, we have it all all live for you so if you want to just do like eight hour days or stuff like that like it's all free content and I was thinking about too, maybe we'll have to come up with some like quick checklist guide or resource as well too, just giving you some bullet points too. But you can also create one yourself as well. Just create like I think the the the, the way that the people the way that people the challenging way that people have in terms of jumping into crypto and then DeFi is that there's obviously no no like structured playbook to to learn, right? But you could create your own playbook. What I mean by that is just create right like literally get like a notebook right here right and then just write one term or a couple terms that you want to do research on so let's say like ave you don't know what ave is that's your that's your study for that week then go to compound study that as well polygon
just go look at all the top DeFi coins first and ask why are they there. That's your that's your straight up like way to just like understand DeFi at that point. Then then from there you can you can go take a look at oracles, all this other stuff. Again, you write down DeFi insurance. Once you understand what your topic you're looking for, then go find all the DeFi insurance products out there. Then just compare them to each other. Then go to DeFi lending, etc. As well too. The, 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 I think the problem with a lot of people when they come and approach to learning something is they don't they don't have a process of thinking about it. And once you think about the approach for it as well, then then you have a more structured way. Then you're not the, the challenge because of this in crypto and because there's no playbook or structured course or thing you can buy. There's no answers that's given towards you. And so you don't have that laid in front of you as well, too, right? And so the knowledge that you're getting is is very ad hoc. Somebody might take you down a DeFi insurance journey, and you might not even care about DeFi insurance. You, know, you ca might care about lending a little bit more. So that's what you need to identify first. Like, what do you want to learn first in DeFi? And then just drill down into it and to that topic. And then you can pop back out and then hop to another DeFi thing, if that makes sense. The, 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 the issue with everybody right now is they're doing it very like ad hoc. They're just jumping around. They're just like getting feed like, oh, somebody's going to show you Oracle. And they're going to show you Polygon. And they're going to show you Polkadot and Cosmos and all that stuff. And then Cosmos IBC. And you're, you're going to hear all this. Your, your learning is very disconnected. And there's no structured there's no structured game plan for you to learn. Well, Chris is like, when moon? I was like, when 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 this one, when, the, <laughs> when this yeah. one moons, right? <laughs> <laughs> to to the moon to the moon but yeah it's like uh, once again it's like if you guys want to really understand the fundamentals of crypto i mean like to get into DeFi, like understand crypto first that's, that's like my personal advice just understand crypto first because uh right after that it's like you understand blockchains or like what blockchains are made for it's really easy because then if you look at like how like the way that i learn is i tie it to real world things so if i'm looking at like compound i'm like okay it's a lending protocol right how does that tie into the real world well if I go to a bank and I want to borrow, let's say, money for a house for a mortgage, right? What happens is that I'm first is like I'm asking the bank for a loan. The bank accepts it. And then from there, I pay back the money monthly. But instead on compound, it's like I don't need their permission. I just go on there. I accept it. I get the rate for that day. The only thing is that for compound is like it's not stable, right? Some days you might pay back a little bit more. Some days you might pay back a little bit less. So it's instead of getting a fixed interest rate loan, it's a variable interest rate loan, right? The variable goes up and down. So depending on like what you place as, as a collateral, right? And the same thing as like whenever you're buying a house, it's like if I place down $30,000 to, to buy like $100,000 house or or whatever, you know, that money, if it if it's worth less, what happens is that now I got to pay back more um, because like the dollar devalued or something, whatever. Um, same thing for like your asset. Like if you placed a car in as a, let's say a collateral for to borrow for a house, but let's say you wrecked your car, of course that that car is now worth less. Like they're not going to give you the same amount that's going to be used as collateral for, right? Um, same thing for like insurance and stuff. I think if like if you just dive into it slowly and take baby steps, but you while you're taking baby steps, like really understand what you're doing, like really understand and really learn, because if you have questions, like make sure you find out how to find those find find those answers. Uh, if not, don't don't be afraid to ask. Like people in crypto are like very friendly, you know. Uh, some well, some more than others, but like for us, like if you ask questions, like we'll most likely want to answer it because we want to help you. Like the <clears throat> the guidance of it is like don't bring people down, bring people up together. So yeah, if you guys uh if you guys like you know once again if you guys really like this and stuff like we're we'll be doing this Monday, Wednesday, and Friday potentially Friday. Um, you know, two to three times a week to kind of answer any questions that we can and kind of provide some of the insights that we see on the market. Like a lot of people didn't know if you can watch the IP 1559 or compounds coming out with like institutional lending um, <clears throat> or if like something gets exploited. Like the, the Bitcoin block difficulty the thing as well is like a lot of people don't look at that on a daily basis or, you know, see it once in a while, like until they actually see, oh, crap, like what happened to the difficulty? If you're a miner, like that's really important for you, right? Uh, for balancer and stuff like that too. It's like if you don't know about asset managers and stuff like that, uh, how would you be able to utilize them? You have to have collateral though. Yeah, of course you always have to have collateral because who's going to give you a loan for nothing? Of course, with with uh, I would say like a bank, right? Bank will 
can sometimes give you collateral. I mean, uh, you don't have to provide collateral for a loan, right? But they're going to charge you an arm and a leg, right? Because you're not a trusty lender. Even if you have a, like a perfect credit score, there's, there's always going to be a way for them to make money off of you. Um, but in a collateral way, uh, in a collateral based system, it's that this is, there's no credit score in crypto in DeFi. Like no one's going to be like, oh yeah, a non number two. Yeah. We fully, we fully trust him with my money. Of course, he's going to give me, uh, he's going to give me his word that he's going to pay back the ETH. No, it's a permissionless system, but it has to have permission in, in certain areas, uh, in order to make it a, a fair model for everyone. Because what, what happens if the platform can just lend out to anybody, but no one pays back, right? Anyone that provided liquidity on that platform just loses money, which is basically free money. Uh, so there has to be some factors that are placed into play in order for you to not game the system, um, not take advantage of anyone else's you know, liquidity and stuff like that. Yeah, once again, uh, let's see. Yeah, right, Chris. Like, you, you know, you got you have to make sure that it's a. Uh, I mean, with a credit score, right? I can go to a bank and they'll be like, "All right, if you have a really good credit score, I'll let you borrow a thousand dollars or something." I'm pretty sure they'll be like, "Okay, cool, do whatever we want with it, as long as you pay us back." Um, but there's no credit score in crypto, <laughs> so you, you kind not of yet. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but I've heard some teams gonna do some. It's gonna be very interesting. You know, like again, like before I got back into crypto, I worked on a uh, credit card startup as well too. And it is very complex. We're not there yet, but it could be very interesting and we could get there. It would take a very well-funded company to, to execute it, but it could happen, uh, especially if there is a company that is able to, they'd have to have a lot of, uh, a lot of collateral actually, because they're going to take on this, this huge risk of being able to um, take your, well, actually, no, uh, I just don't think it's actually been implemented. I, I think it could be possible because they could, they could take it. Could be gamified, uh, man. <laughs> yeah, they've always done it yet. Actually, maybe we should do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, with the credit card startup I was trying to build was basically creating an alternative uh, way to um, alternative way to uh, prove your credit worthiness. And this is not using credit uh, score. We were looking at your income as well as the assets that you own, and then get floating you. Um, small credit, so like five hundred dollars just to start, and then from there um, increase it uh, as well as you go, and then that still contributed to your credit score uh, as well. So we created our own underwriting system um, to kind of judge that as well. And there's no reason why you can't do that with crypto collateral or stablecoin collateral uh, in the future. Nobody has built it yet because it takes you know you have to build. There's a lot of red tape from both like the fintech and and traditional finance space to combine that with DeFi, but i do believe that it could be here and somebody you know somebody could build it but it's it's not quite there yet um that's a huge opportunity though um, imagine being able to give credit ac accessible credit to people that are normally not um, able to do so because of the credit score system but they're cash rich or the crypto rich or the stablecoin rich um, could you float them some credit you definitely could um decentralized credit though i don't know we'll see um it's a very hard game to balance um but the opportunity is there um to do so yeah it's, it's gonna be really difficult and uh like there's always gonna be gamifications of it too it's like how do you put parameters in place to to make sure that these this person's like trustworthy and stuff like that but i guess we, we can kind of uh we can kind of see like once once more products come out and everything Yeah. All right. If you guys have any more questions, you know, feel free to, to send them now. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try to answer as many as we can. But uh, we'll, yeah. once again, you, you know, we're going to have this again on uh, on Wednesday as well. So in two days. So if you guys have any questions or even if, you know, you, re you really, really want to ask those questions, uh, join us at uh, t.me slash DeFi Summit. It's actually our Telegram group. So that we'll, uh, we're more, more, more active on there uh, on a day to day basis. So you guys can check us out there yeah. as well. One thing I'll also add to is this: we'll do the video recap. Well, this will be automatically uploaded to YouTube, so you can kind of watch it as well. Uh, and then we'll start sending out a quick, short newsletter too, just like even bullet points of like what's happening in DeFi and crypto, so that we can give you kind of caught up what's what's going on in the space. We'll have to hire like a full-time writer soon, but we don't have that yet. But we'll we'll do our best to just even you know 
done is better than perfect. We'll get it, you know, just get you some bullet points on what's going on, what you can think about as well, just to give you kind of like educated on what's happening. DeFi is moving so fast every week there's something as well. We'll try to do like a one recap at least at the start of the week. And then if we once we have a full time writer, we can recap at the start of the week, end of the week type of situation and, and go from there as well too. So but uh yeah, thanks Chris, thanks Iqbal, and thanks uh uh Ty, like everybody that's just asked a lot of questions, been involved, and there's many others too that are just like passively sitting in um in the background as well too. We we appreciate you guys' support, great questions. I'm always happy to, to be part of the group and uh, yeah, let's build let's continue building together. Thanks guys. Awesome.